Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Keep It Clean 2024 Product Advisory Webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Heidi Dancho, the Director of Communications at the Canola Council of Canada here in Winnipeg, and I'll be moderating today's session. As an export-driven industry, the success of Canadian agriculture depends on steady and predictable access to major international markets. Crop protection product application decisions are an, are an important part of that, and that's why we're here today. The Keep It Clean product advisory is an excellent tool to guide growers, agronomists, and agri-retailers, and we trust that you'll find value in today's session. Before we get started, I'll review the Zoom webinar system and explain how to participate in today's event. On your screen, you will see a chat tab and a Q&A tab. Please use the chat tab for hellos and general comments, and if you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar. And please submit your questions through the Q&A tab. We'll review the questions and respond to them at the end of the webinar, but please submit your questions as we go along. And if we don't get to your question during the Q&A portion, we will follow up with you via email, and you could also feel free to reach us anytime at info at keepitclean.ca. As a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and a recording of today's session will be emailed out to all participants and posted on keepitclean.ca. We have a lot to cover this morning, so we'll get started. Next slide, please. Today, we have three speakers with us to provide timely information about which crop protect protection products may create market risk in 2024 and how the Canadian grain industry is working together to mitigate these risks. I want to welcome Greg Bartley, Director of Crop Protection and Crop Quality for Pulse Canada, who will review the crop and product combinations that may cause market risk for pulses. Krista Zuzak, Director of Crop Protection and Production for Cereals Canada, who will review the crop and product combinations that may cause market risk for cereals. And Ian Epp, Agronomy Specialist at the Canola Council of Canada, who will provide an update for canola, along with some important tips on following the label when applying crop protection products this season. I will pass it over to Greg and Krista to start us off with reviewing the importance of these practices and the process to determine market risk. Over to you, Greg. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Heidi, and welcome everyone to the Keep It Clean Product Advisory webinar. It's great to see so many people joining today. So uh, we'll go to the next slide there, please. So going to kind of provide a bit of background in terms of, of, of why we're doing this webinar and understanding the issues in our export markets. Um, first and foremost, I mean, there shouldn't be um, surprise to anyone, you know, Canadian agriculture is export dependent. So what we produce here in Canada far exceeds our domestic demand, so we need to rely on our export markets or ability to export to continue to be successful uh, as an industry. So, for example, uh, just how much do we export uh, for canola? Over eighty, over ninety percent of our canola is exported, eighty percent of our wheat, and eighty-five percent of our pulses. And from a pulse perspective, um, we export to over one hundred and thirty different countries. So it's a it's a lot to keep an eye on, and it's make sure that uh, we're doing all we can to protect the, our ability to export these crops. Next slide, please. So the grain that we export, um, we must meet the requirements for export markets. So what we're highlighting here is that, you know, even though we have the regulations here in Canada, whether it's related to MRLs or how anything else that we produce, it's the export, it's the regulations or export markets that we need to pay attention to as when we export, we have to meet those, those, uh, those export requirements. So things that we have to look out for is, is something called sanitary and phytosanitary requirements. And these are constantly changing export markets. So I have a bit of a, a fact sheet here I just pulled from the World Trade or Organization. Nothing you need to worry about, but just want to highlight that just in the past year, so this is in 2023, there are over uh, 100, almost 2,000 notifications of SPS changes in an export market. So 65 different countries put forward over 2,000 changes. Now, this is this all of these changes has the opportunity to, to create a potential trade barrier. And MRLs is just a subset of, of that 2000, but just want to highlight how many countries are changing the regulations or updating their SPS measures and how much potential that has uh, to, to create a trade concern. So these are constantly changing. Um, other factors we need to uh, be aware of that MRL policies in our export markets are, are inconsistent. And I'll have a slide next that kind of speaks to this, but just highlighting that, you know, this inconsistency in measures is what really drives the potential for trade concerns. 
Other factors that uh, I think we just need to be aware about or understand is, is really the erosion of a science-based approach to crop protection products in some of these markets, especially some of these influential markets. So really, this is a highlight, to, you know, I think when we think of this, uh, we, we focus on the European Union and their hazard-based approach, hazard approach to crop protection products and how that really drives this misalignment in, in the regulatory frameworks in our export markets and how that creates trade concern. And I'll talk a bit about that in, in a bit. A couple other factors to think about, you know, commercial pressure towards pesticide free products. So this is really lumping into two different buckets. You know, when we think of the regulations in our export market is really where we are focused on, make sure that regulatory, regulatory environment is facilitating our export. But there's also other factors around commercial pressure that we need to, to consider to make sure we're meeting uh, the demands of, of some of our customers. And that's why you see kind of the different supply chains uh, to meeting those demands. Finally, and really want to drive this one home is just the increased frequency and sensitivity of testing going on right now, especially as it relates to, to MRLs or, or residues, um, is increasing. You know, I think if we had this conversation five years ago, we, we had the same message and just highlighting, you know, how things are changing, things, how, how we need to pay, pay attention to this stuff. But I think five years from now coming to today, you know, it's just that much more. You know, this is ever evolving. Uh, there's a large focus towards MRLs and 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 the need to pay attention to this is, is just is super important. Next slide. So if you've attended this webinar before, you always know that I start with uh, uh, what is an MRL. It's, it's a good spot to make sure we're all on the same page and understand, um, just make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what MRLs are. So MRL stands for a maximum residue limit. And what this means is, is the highest amount of pesticide residue that, that may remain on or in a food product when a pesticide used according to label directions. And I really want to key in on that last piece, label directions. When you hear the statements of always read and follow the label or, or why, you know, look, looking at the use of products is so important, it's really back to the fact that MRLs are based on that label directions. So that's why it's important you must stay within the label directions, because if you go outside that those directions, that's when you get potential MRL, uh, MRL uh, potential for, for problems. So that's why it's so important to follow the label. MRLs are a legal and enforceable limit, so it's really just to help identify to make sure that product is used according to those label directions. Uh, just highlighting here that MRLs are not a measure of food safety. That's not what they're established for. That's not what they're meant for. However, food safety is considered before an MRL is established. So anytime an MRL is established, it goes through a dietary risk assessment. So it's considered, but that's not what it was meant for. It's not measured for food safety. Now there's a, uh, an infographic here I pulled from, from the PMR website. And I, I really encourage everyone, if you're really interested to understand MRLs or how they're established, the PMR has put out a, a ton of good information in the past year or two. Uh, to properly communicate what MRLs are to the public. So if you had a chance, just Google PMRA MRL fact sheet, and it gives a, a very high level overview of what MRLs are, how they're set, and how they're used uh, within our own regulatory system here in Canada, but also be in context to, uh, to our export markets as well. So I encourage everyone to go check that out. But the real kicker here in, in when we talk about MRLs is, is understanding that you know our Canadian crops must meet the MRL set by our destination country to avoid trade disruption. So even though we have our own MRL list here in Canada and, and MRLs are established, when we export our crops, it's the export market MRLs that we need to pay attention to. Next slide. So when I say MRL policies are in, inconsistent export markets, I, I just want to give you a, a brief overview of, of what that inconsistency is and, and how that drives a potential trade uh, trade problem. So when we look at the different uh, MRL policies, there's kind of three different factors we look at. Uh, the first is, it, do they have their own national list? So Country like Canada, we have our own MRL database. We set our own our list. Not all countries are like that. Some countries don't have the regulatory capacity to be establishing MRLs, so they might not have an MRL list, and they defer to a, an international standard such as Codex Alimentarius. Uh, the other factor I look at is is there a deferral pathway? So what I mean by a deferral pathway is, is say there there is no MRL established in that export market, or maybe it's misaligned. You know, can that country then defer? to another country's MRL list or to that international standard codex. So instead of just having no MRL, you know, your product's not compliant, can you refer to another country that has an MRL established and, and still be uh, trade compliant? The other factor is, do they have a default MRL policy? So for example, here in Canada, we have a default MRL policy of 0 0.1 parts per million. What that means is if we don't have an MRL, then the default of 0 0.1 parts per million applies. Now we have to pay attention to different countries because that default can be different. Uh, so if you look at the European Union, that default MRL is 0 0.01 parts per million, 10 times lower than what we have in Canada. So that can be a, a problematic where if they don't have an MRL established, you know, now it's much lower than what we're basing it off here in Canada 
even though, you know, if we did a registered product, we would have an MRL established. So if you look at all these different countries, um, just highlighting here that, again, the lack of MRL deferral pathways just increases the, the chance of missing misaligned MRLs and really and increases the potential for MRL non-compliance. Now, I have a country here, um, Par Paraguay is highlighted here. Um, honestly, I'm not sure how much we export to Paraguay, but I just want to highlight, you know, what good MRL policy looks like. And I like this, this country's example because they have their own, own national MRL list. That's great. They set their MRLs. However, if they don't have an M, uh, don't have an MRL if it's missing, then they defer to Codex. That's the first step. And then if Codex on the MRL, they don't stop there. Then they look at EU next. So they're trying to do their best to make sure that they have an MRL to refer to to reduce that uh, potential for non-compliance. This is good policy. Um, the other point to, have, uh, to highlight here is that um, more countries are establishing or amending their national MRL list. So there's a lot of focus on MRLs right now. A lot of countries are, are trying to um, kind of look inward, making sure that they're, they're covered themselves. So in the past five years, we've seen South Korea, China, uh, even Great Britain establish or reestablish their MRL list. Uh, Great Britain obviously moving away from the EU. Now they have their own focus on MRL list. And, and Turkey is another one where, where they're aligning with the EU MRL. So anytime that anyone is establishing MRL lists or, or revisiting them, it just creates that potential for misalignment as MRL changes. It could also create potential for alignment too. I'm not saying this is a bad thing when people are doing it. It just highlights the potential for opportunities to be misaligned. Next slide. Um, just doing a, a quick call to the European Union. Um, when you look at MRL policies and, and MRL challenges, the European Union comes up comes up a lot. And and it's so I just want to I guess really touch on it really really briefly. The magnitude of MRL changes in the EU has implications for all. So for the past or as example here in the past year, uh, so in 2023, uh, just for seal stats, there have been over 100 pesticide MRL changes affecting wheat, barley, and oats. That's just one year. Now, obviously, not all these MRL changes are, are you know, have implications, you know, just because MRL changes doesn't mean it's going to cause a trade concern. However, it just highlights how often this is changing and how often we need to pay attention to are these, how are they changing and does this have an implication to what we do here in Canada? Now, the factors contributing to the EU's MRL you know, removal of pesticides and MRLs or why this is such an issue uh, comes down to a, a few different factors, but Really, the EU's hazard-based cutoff criteria, hazard-based approach to pesticides uh, is, is an implication. So basically, if, if a product is deemed carcinogenic, it's automatically not renewed. It's just done, doesn't go through a risk assessment, it's removed from the market. So obviously, the MRLs would go along with it. Um, there's also an inconsistent and unpredictable import tolerance process. So even if there was a missing MRL or if you wanted to maintain, a, an, and maintain an MRL if a product was removed, that process is unpredictable. You know, it seems like the goalposts keep moving within the, in the EU. They keep asking for my data. It's unclear what that data actually is at the start of the process. So what we see is actually companies just um, not go through the process. You know, how much money do you invest to try and meet the demands if those demands keep changing? So that contributes to why we see MRLs disappearing. As well, the pesticide approval process has unfortunately become political. So within the EU, even though EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, does all the risk assessments, you know, does the looks at the, the MRL applications, many times this goes to a final vote in a political setting. So they have to sign off on it and say, yes, this is yes, we'll adopt this or no, we won't. That influences a political step in the process, which is very unfortunate. Just adding here with the fact sheets, um, since the EU is such a, a, a challenging market to, to keep up with and, and we need to pay attention to it, um, Crop Life International has done a great job to make sure that the industry is well prepared to understand what's coming down the pipeline. So they produce a, a quarterly report that just highlights, you know, what products are coming up for new, what's auto automatically not renewed, and just gives us early indication of things we need to watch out for and unfortunately prepare for if we know that it, there's a good chance it might not be renewed. Uh, next slide. So we know there's a problem. We know that MRL challenges in export markets are causing issues. We know there's potential for trade concern. Great. What are we doing about it? What are we doing as commodity associations to make sure that growers have access to good crop protection products here in Canada and, and are able to use that product? And also our exporters um, are, are in a good place to make sure that they're, they're not creating trade uh, uh, trade concerns. Um, so I'd like to break this down into kind of a short, medium, long-term approach of, of how do you approach this. Short term is just making sure there's no unacceptable uh, level of trade risk. So how do we do this is, is we're constantly reviewing the market risk of crop protection products. So 
as those MRL changes are happening in markets, you know, we we try and keep up to date with that and then we're evaluating them to see is, does that cause a trade concern if we use that product here in Canada. And then if we do highlight where there's potential trade concern, we then communicate it through through the program, like the Keep It Clean program. It's why you're all here today is to, to figure it out. So this is the outcome of that process. Also, uh, we implement robust quality assurance programs. So as a short-term tactic, we just want to make sure that we're monitoring the MRL levels over time. Uh, so a lot of the exporters um, have these quality assurance programs in place to make sure that they're just monitoring what's happening year to year and make sure that anything going out isn't causing trade concern. Medium term, uh, so if we do identify there is an MRL risk, uh, we, we work to, to resolve it, to be honest. Uh, we wanna make sure that we do have MROs in place. So the products that growers have access to here in Canada are able to be used and aren't causing those trade concerns. So this is working with the product registrants, if it's an import tolerance application, see if we can support and, and go through that process. However, as I mentioned with the EU, there can be challenges with that. So it's not always a, a clear case where it's just simple to file the application and you're done. This is a kind of a medium multi-year process, uh, but it's what we're working towards and make sure that we're, we're covering all our bases. And finally, long-term, again, this is kind of pie in the sky, but you know, all the work towards this is we got to keep on top of this, is really looking at that broader multi-commodity, multi-country effort to advocate for MRL harmonization. We don't want these separate MRL lists that are creating misalignment. We don't want cases where there's a missing MRL in export market where it's going to cause an unnecessary trade concern. So what can we do to get the regulatory agencies to collaborate, harmonize regulations, harmonize MRLs, create these deferral pathways to make sure that there's no unnecessary trade concerns? And again, that's a long-term approach. There's lots of forums where this goes on, but we contribute through that conversation and the Canada Grains Council uh, is representing us well in those conversations, as well as the Government Canada and industry partners. It's a full team of approach on this one. Next up, next slide. Um, so obviously I mentioned keep it clean program. That's going to be the rest of this presentation, but I just want to highlight on, on, you know, that other short-term action of, of quality, quality assurance program. So what I want to highlight here is just how our kind of grain, uh, system works. And, and there can be differences in, in how that works, depending on if you're a small crop that goes up by container, or if you're a larger crop that goes out by, by bulk shipment. So just a very high level slide here, uh, just highlighting how the different ways that grain can move through the supply chain. So production level, it's a farm level, that can either go to a primary processor or a value added processor. And there's two different streams there. Even if it does go to a value added processor, so this could be oil crush, it could be pea processing, you, know, you name it. You know, there is a pathway from once it's in a primary processor to go to that value added processor too. So there's multiple different steps there of how that can move. From there, again, if you're a smaller crop, you could go to a source load container and, and go out, uh, to port by container ship, or you can enter a hopper car and then get transloaded at port and transloaded to container at port. So again, this is more small lot shipments. Give an example, especially from, uh, from a pulse perspective of how many how much of our pulses are exported by container. 50% um, of our lentils, 30% of our peas, and 100% of our beans and chickpeas go out by container. The reason why I say this is, is the risk level or the risk profile of MRL not compliances varies depending how it goes out, either by container or bulk shipment. If it's by container, there's less blending going on, that has potential to increase or have a higher increased potential for an MRL non-compliance due to that non-blending, uh, less blending factor. Obviously from value added processor too, uh, less blending going on here too. Uh, so there's different ways they can get to an end use manufacturer uh, from that standpoint. The point here also is that there's many different opportunities along the supply chain that you can test for residues. So this could happen either at the primary processor or value added processor. So as soon as they receive that, it's an opportunity for testing or holding samples to test. In these situations too, there could be some bulking. So say they're filling a bin, few, you know, multiple farms going into that bin. In most cases, what you see is, is that bin is tested. So multiple farms coming in, okay, we're going to test this bin. That's an opportunity for a testing point. And then as you go through the supply chain, you know, transloading, probably less, less common, uh, end, use end use manufacturer, absolutely, and export customer. So there's different touch points here where the grain is handled and different opportunities for testing along the supply chain. And this is what I'm highlighting here again, is that things are changing. These level of testing is increasing, and it just means that we need to be much more aware of the potential MRL risk and much more aware of the MRLs in export markets. So the assumption here is just assume your grain will be tested at some point along the supply chain, whether it's right at the start or at our end use customers. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so from here, I'm going to pass it off, off to my colleague, Krista from Serials to jump into the Keep It Clean program and, and get into the meat of the presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, and yeah, just to touch on our Keep It Clean program a little bit more. Um, the Keep It Clean program is a joint initiative. So we have um, partnership across the Canola Council of Canada, Serials Canada, Pulse Canada, um, as well as the Prairie Oak Growers Association. And the goal of this program is to provide these resources and information for growers as well as crop advisors um, to grow market ready crops. So that's often our tagline is market ready crops. And it's really thinking about um, what Greg has outlined of, you know, where these market risks might exist and how we can provide timely information and updates where starting at the farm level, um, we can mitigate some of these risks. And I also want to acknowledge that um, Keep It Clean is funded in part through the Agri-Marketing Program, which is under the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Next slide, please. So um, really, when we want to start this off, we're thinking about using acceptable pesticides only as part of Keep It Clean. So you might be familiar with pesticides that are you know, registered for use in Canada on a certain crop, which is very important obviously, um, but also the other part of using acceptable pesticides only is thinking about using products that won't create these unnecessary trade concerns that Greg alluded to. And really, um, one of the best ways we think about that is the advice of talk to your grain buyer. So really having those conversations in advance about um, the crop protection products that you're planning to use or that you're using, and if these are acceptable both domestically, but also for some of those export considerations that we want to make. And um, we'll outline it more in the presentation today, but a lot of those factors we consider are through those missing or misaligned MRLs or um, possibly other market acceptance issues. Next slide, please. So as also Greg and Heidi mentioned, um, you know, with Canada being so export dependent, it really does introduce a lot of market risks for trade. So whether this is respect to um, pest control product use or non-tariff trade barriers, so address part of this, um, a policy was developed by the Canada Grains Council. Canada Grains Council represents the interests of the Canadian grain, oil seed, um, pulse and special crop sectors. And really they represent the full value chain, which includes Canadian growers, um, seed and life science companies, commodity associations like cereals, pulse and canola, um, as well as grain companies and public research institutions. And this market acceptance of pesticide use policy or policy as I'll just refer to it as, um, it was developed to be proactive in addressing risks so that pesticides don't become another non-tariff trade barrier in agriculture, which is that growing trend Greg referenced. So for example, even watching the news and seeing um, proposed bans on glyphosate in other countries, it really does emphasize that importance of having science-based decision-making and policy. It's also worth mentioning that this policy was developed in collaboration with grower associations, our national commodity associations, grain companies, life science companies, and also our members from the Canadian Association of Ag Retailers. It's a voluntary policy um, that our national commodity organizations form a committee on in order to assess risk. Next slide, please. So just to break it down a little further, when we, we think about an MRL assessment committee, it can be a bit of a, a daunting thought. So just to break it down into what comprises this, really the, the goal of this is to have all of the all of the important players or all the important members at the table when we're making these decisions. So the way that these committees um, operate, so Pulse has one, Canola has one, we have one for Cereals Canada, for example. Um, we do some analysis on these, these actives or these chemistries that we're looking to categorize or, or looking to um, explore a little bit more in depth. And we look at things like residue data, but there are other factors um, that I'll outline further down in the policy. And what we have is, you know, our registrants that have the um, chemistry under review there at the table to provide this information like the residue data that goes into our assessments. But we also have our grain handlers and shippers there to provide that export um, angle. We have egg retailers there who would be the ones helping um, you know, move these products along or recommend them to farmers, for example. 
And then also speaking of farmers, we also have grower representatives there. So we really also want to have, you know, that, that boots on the ground um, perspective and, you know, how or where these tools might be used by growers, for example. And everyone sits down at the table together um, as long with the value chain organization representative. So for example, for Sirius Canada, that would be me. And we make a recommendation based on the factors in the policy that I'm going to cover today and have a conversation about how to best categorize that. Again, keeping in mind that these are products that are registered in Canada, but we're looking at that acceptability side. So what other risks um, might it pose beyond that? Next slide, please. So when we look at the steps to determining market risk, we do have some criteria that are laid out. So first, we review the markets of interest. So essentially, what are the key countries that we need to worry about? Um, and there are cutoffs for, for thresholds of what those look like. So there are some um, that vary by the crop. So for example, in cereals, you know, there's different countries that we think about for wheat versus barley versus oats. Um, but there are also some markets of interest. So the, the EU, for example, that we see, you know, being more of a, a policy trendsetter, like that example Greg gave, where other countries might be deferring to the EU MRLs. Or we might see um, some countries that are undergoing more of a, a change in their policy. So um, countries like China or South Korea, for example. Secondly, we review the pesticides that have residue levels, which could be a trade issue. So um, keeping in mind, again, I'll go through a, a more of a breakdown of it, but um, not only new actives on the market, but also those that are existing. And thirdly, we think about the level of risk that these factors pose. So really, when we think about this level of risk and how close a call this is, what we're looking at is really balancing, you know, the need for new active ingredients to manage these challenges in the field, but balancing that with the risk to market access and, and really how close is that call or, or how do we make that decision? Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, when we think about what pesticides we're reviewing, um, we start with our you know, new or amended pesticide registrations. So um, this might be a, a label expansion, for example. So it's being used on a new crop, but it's an existing active. It could also be a brand new active. And also in this, we include those that are previously categorized. So um, those actives that have been on 2023 um, product advisory, for example. And then from there, we use this inverted triangle or sort of a, a funnel approach, um, and we use this to determine the further pesticides of interest. So first, um, when we look at pesticides with a Canadian MRL of 0 0.01 parts per million, so quite low, these are excluded from the assessment. Next, we have pesticides that are excluded if they have MRLs at or below the MRLs in markets of interest, so essentially no tight MRLs. Or as Greg mentioned, you know, if our MRLs in Canada, for example, um, are set higher than, you know, where we're exporting to, then we have um, less of a concern there. Also, if there are no residues, those pesticides are also excluded by the policy because then we don't have residues to be factoring in. And then the final exclusion we make is if this product is used on limited acres. So that threshold is set at less than 5% um, of acres of a crop type or 200,000 acres, just depending. Um, so this also has to do with kind of that dilution factor. So Greg talked about um, containerized shipping. So that's something that would concentrate residues versus something like wheat that shipped bulk. If we think about it being a product being applied at less than 5% of the acres and then blending when it's being bulk handled, um, this is something that would produce much of a lower risk. And then from there, um, based on everything we're able to exclude that's registered on a, a specific crop, we look at what remains. Next slide, please. So when we think about um, determining risk, we talk a lot about residue data, and often this is the primary driver, but um, it may not be a single factor that determines this high or low risk. So what we also look at, um, for example, in the likelihood of residues, um, it has to do with things like the use patterns, so different use patterns that exist for pesticides, or the pest pressure. So for example, in cereals, something like um, fusarium head blight, which is you know, very serious and has yield implications, as well as mycotoxin production, which can cause a human health concern, but also a market access concern. That's a, a fairly important pathogen for us to manage 
And in some crops like barley, you may have limited options. So we're, we're taking that into account when we're doing this, um, this assessment as well. And again, balancing that need for actives with market risk. As well, there are some factors that fall into um, handling and shipping. So we've already talked about kind of that um, shipment in bulk that would dilute residues versus shipment in containers, um, something that would concentrate those residues a little bit more. And then we also make some of these um, destination or end use considerations. Um, so again, what Greg was alluding to about differing regulatory systems and understanding what those look like um, in the markets that we're exporting to, for example. Next slide, please. So this brings us to our product categorization. And again, really why we're here today to talk about this product advisory and how we make those categorizations that go onto the advisory. So those three steps that I've outlined for you so far, these are then used to make that categorization. Um, and I like to think of it a bit like a, a traffic light analogy. So um, green on the far right hand of your slide, green classifies products which do not require a recommendation based on their risk level. Whereas yellow, or we often call it amber in the middle category, um, this is bee informed. And this is where treated grains may not be accepted by all exporters, depending on the circumstances. And it's worth mentioning the products with this amber advisory require additional consideration, such as um, contacting grain buyers before using products. And finally, to finish up with our, um, our traffic light analogy, you know, a red light level would be a a stop or a, you know, a no-go. In this case, it's a do not use advisory. And um, this classifies a product with an elevated level of an MRL related trade disruption. So this chemistry or this crop use pattern um, likely will not be accepted by grain buyers. So growers would be advised not to use this chemistry or this crop use pattern. Next slide, please. And then this brings us again to why we're here today, but really how these decisions are communicated and, you know, the annually updated product advisory. Um, so you might notice this year when you um, refer to the product advisory for 2024, that it has a bit of an updated look and feel. So um, we've added the quick links for crop type to the top of each section to make it more user friendly. Um, and I'm very happy today to, uh, to walk us through what this new updated product advisory looks like. Next slide, please. So um, the product advisory has this newly added summary of categorizations table. So this only includes the actives with red or amber categorizations. So those which growers are advised not to use or to be informed when making those application decisions in advance. As I mentioned, the policy does have the red, the amber, and the green for do not use, be informed, and you know, no recommendation or no categorization. Um, but we felt like it was the most important to um, communicate to growers and crop advisors about where those watch outs might be or you know, where we need to exercise extra caution. So this updated view, it allows growers and agronomists to view the advisory on an active by active basis. Um, and then the crops are included under each of the red or amber category. Um, as well, we've also ordered these to align with the growing season, starting with fungicides and ending with desiccants. Next slide, please. The next section on the digital copy of our product advisory is the comprehensive guide. Um, so this is where you can view the information organized by active ingredient, like in previous years or the view that you might be used to. This guide also includes the additional information um, on why these actives have an advisory on their use. For example, this can help clarify, you know, whether there are MRLs that are missing or misaligned in some key export markets or whether this issue pertains more um, to marketing issues that might be in place. And this part of the comprehensive guide is also helpful, again, just to really drill into the, you know, why we have these advisories. So it's not just not to use this product, but um, to help understand, you know, why this recommendation or this categorization has been made through the policy. Next slide, please. So from here, um, I'm going to jump into the product advisory for cereals and our direct product updates. Um, and maybe before I get into that, 
Um, I just want to mention or highlight that um, there are no new actives that have been added to the advisory on cereals this year, and we've also not made any changes to existing advisories that you've seen from uh, 2023. Next slide, please. So um, as well, I just you know highlighted for you the, the new ways that we're viewing it or the new look and feel online. So in that spirit, um, I'm gonna review the advisories by crop. And this again, reflects that new added layout online, um, starting with barley for food or feed. So we do separate barley into food and feed and then a separate category for malt um, for your information. So beginning with our fungicides, um, there are potential MRL marketing risks for barley um, for food and feed that are treated with fluopyram exported to some markets so the recommendation is to have that conversation with your grain buyer before applying products with this active. And this has to do with um, MRLs in some key markets. And you'll notice um, at the bottom of the slides as well, we've included um, those MRLs and import tolerances um, that we're looking at for the crop for the key markets that we're discussing today. Um, as well, we also do see potential MRL marketing risks um, for barley that's treated with tetraconazole, um, but this active has a red or a do not use categorization on it, and this is due to missing MRLs um, in China as well as the codex MRL is missing. Next slide, please. Um, continuing with barley for food and feed, um, there are two other amber or bee informed categorizations, again, reflecting that importance of having conversations with your grain buyer ahead of applying these products. So there are MRL alignment issues with chlormaquat in some barley markets that can create market risk. And I also wanted to highlight that there is um, potential MRL marketing risk for barley that's treated with glyphosate. However, this is market-based as MRLs for glyphosate are established. Next slide, please. So moving on to um, malt barley and the implications we see there. Again, to start with fungicides, um, grain buyers will not accept malt barley treated with fluopyram or tetraconazole due to MRL marketing risks identified in some of these key export markets. So as I mentioned, um, fluopyram is an amber or a bee informed on barley for food and feed, but the market breakdown for malt creates additional risk. So the recommendation is to not use this active on malt barley. As well, we see um, similar MRL marketing risks for malt barley that's treated with tetraconazole. And as, as a result, this active has a red or a do not use categorization, the same as um, for barley for food and feed due to those missing MRLs in China and with Codex. Next slide, please. And to finish off malt barley, um, we have three other products. So malt barley has um, the most advisories on our product advisory. So when we look at chlormaquat, um, it has the same advisory on malt barley as barley for food and feed with an amber. So again, looking into those um, contract obligations and acceptance before you apply chlormaquat to your malt barley. Glyphosate has a red categorization on malt barley um, despite MRLs being established. And I also wanted to point out um, under the same category is saflufenacil. So um, specifically malt barley will not be accepted by grain buyers if it is treated with saflufenacil. However, this one um, is not an MRL issue, but it has to do with the negative effects on the malting process. But also keep in mind that you did not see saflufenacil for barley for food and feed. So it is okay to use there, but we wanna um, avoid using it on malt barley specifically. Next slide, please. And then moving into wheat. Um, so for here, you'll notice that um, as well with oats, we only have um, glyphosate and they're both an amber or a bee informed. So glyphosate maintains this classification of amber or bee informed on wheat. And what this means is, again, you should be you know, consulting with your grain buyer before using glyphosate on wheat. Um, but also just some tips and reminders about glyphosate. So when the use of glyphosate is allowed, um, the reminder that it is registered for pre-harvest weed control and not as a desiccant. And also to further reduce the risk of unacceptable residues in your harvested grain, 
really, again, that message about following the label that we try to instill and only applying pre-harvest glyphosate when that grain moisture is less than 30%. And this is in the least mature part of the field, um, which can also include any areas of regrowth which may produce seed. So this is important to keep in mind um, in years that we've seen. So for example, um, in 2022 or other years where we had um, drought that caused some of that secondary growth happening in parts of our cereal growing regions. Next slide, please. And oh, so finally for um, the cereals product advisory update, um, glyphosate maintains that classification of amber or be informed on oats, the same as on wheat. Um, and the rationale is the same as on wheat, where we do have glyphosate MRLs in place, but acceptance in some markets despite this is, you know, where we can run into some of those issues. So again, having that conversation before you use glyphosate really on your oats, your wheat, or your barley as we covered, um, and always follow that label to keep within those MRLs as Greg mentioned. And with this, um, Greg, I will pass it on to you for the update on pulses for this growing season. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Krista. Um, hopefully everyone's still with us. Let's, uh, you know, we're almost getting through this presentation and hope you're finding this information uh, useful. Reminder, questions in the Q&A, definitely get them in there and we'll hopefully address those at the end if you do have any questions, but uh, we'll get to the, the Pulse products here. So next slide. Uh, so just as a high level, I've, I've pulled the, the Pulse classifications here just to highlight, you know, what, what are the classifications specifically for pulses? So First off, I just want to highlight that uh, if you're familiar with the advisory from last year, we've removed two products from the advisory. Uh, this is always, you know, our intention is, is or our goal really is to, to not have to communicate products. So it's always great to see these products come off. However, I'm going to highlight two different reasons. Uh, one's positive, one's negative. Uh, so for the cethoxidum, um, this product's been removed uh, simply because um, in good cases, the MRL, potential MRL change that uh, those causing the, the unclarity in terms of what that risk could be, uh, we have clarity on the timeline now. So in a couple of years, uh, it's been shelved for a couple of years. So we know that there is no there is no change, at least for, for a couple of years on that one. That being said, though, uh, BSF did to make the commercial decision to uh, remove Cethoxum from the market. So that factored into as well. Just the, you know, the availability of Cethoxum is just not there on the market. So obviously, if it's not available less MRL concern as you go through the risk process, which is the rationale why it doesn't need to be on the advisor anymore. Chlorothalonil on a more positive note. Um, so the MRL change for chlorothalonil happened uh, a few years ago now in the EU where they dropped it to a default level. Um, at the time, we didn't have too much uh, real world data to understand what the potential trade risk was. So it was, it was more of a, a precautionary approach to make sure that you know we aren't causing unnecessary trade concern. There's a bit of conflicting data. We did residue testing of farm level products to help us understand what that risk level is. And all that testing came back as non-detects. So it shows that even if farmers are using this product according to label directions, it doesn't cause the trade concern that was um, unclear at the time. So based on this data, based on, you know, there's robust quality assurance programs again that I had at the front uh, at the start of the presentation, it gives us enough confidence to, to remove this from the, the advisories, which is always good news. Highlight on that one, though, uh, just to make sure that everyone's aware, the PMRA has proposed to cancel all uses of chlorothalonil. Uh, so we're anticipating the PMRA to make a final decision on that this growing season. So we're watching that one closely. We're hoping uh, that that is not the case, knowing the importance of this product to, to pulse growers. But I uh, just want to highlight to make sure everyone's not caught off guard and we're anticipating that decision, hopefully uh, sometime this year. Classifications for this year, uh, two active ingredients, glyphosate, glyphosate, and ammonium. Uh, I'll jump into the, the crops specifically to highlight uh, what you need to know for each crop. So next slide. So first I'm gonna uh, lump chickpeas and fava beans together as uh, they both have the classification for, for glyphosate. So when we when we communicate the, the market risk for glyphosate, um, I wanna highlight that the MRLs are established in all of our export markets. So from an MRL standpoint, you know, we're in a pretty good position. Uh, so this classification is less to do with the regulatory landscape. It's the acknowledgement that the consumer uh, demands or certain situations where there could be consumer um, specifications uh, is playing into the, the awareness of, of your need before using this product. So. Uh, this is where we communicate this with an MA notation. It's just to highlight that the, the emeralds are in place. This isn't due to regulatory factors. It's due to market acceptance issues. So the important message here is just to understand that glyphosate is highly scrutinized. I don't think anyone's everyone's aware of that. 
and that some grain buyers might have restrictions on the use of pre-armed spice state. So just keep this in mind. Again, reinforcing uh, Chris's, mess Chris's message around proper use. If you are using PRF's glyphosate for PRF's weed control, make sure that timing is correct. It's crucial. That 3% moisture content, you got to be below that. Otherwise, there's chance of elevated residues in the harvested grain, which will uh, run up to our, our regulatory concerns. So make sure you're, you're, you're applying it correctly. Next slide. Looking at dry beans, uh, we have two classifications here. Uh, so glyphosate, uh, same messaging. Again, the, the classification here is uh, just to highlight that uh, there are market acceptance issues and a little more focus actually on this one. When we do look at uh, the, the dry bean dealers and their acceptance, safe to say most of the dry bean dealers, if not all, do not accept pre-harvest glyphosate. So essentially uh, you should be aware of that. I'm sure you're communicating with your dry bean dealers as most of this crop is contract based. Just know that most dry bean dealers do not accept pre-harvest glyphosate. Uh, so at this point, you're likely it's already been removed as an option if you're under that contract production. Uh, so just be aware of that. Glufosinate and ammonium, uh, just want to highlight the difference in product registrations. And we'll get into this as we get into to lentils next. But um, just highlighting that when we talk about glufosinate and ammonium on dry beans, uh, the registration in Eastern Canada is different than Western Canada. So there is a registration on dry beans in Eastern Canada. When you look at the emerald landscape, it doesn't look good. Uh, to be frank, uh, our emeralds are, miss are missing a misaligned in all, most of our major export markets. However, we do see an emerald in Japan. Now I've highlighted here in brackets, uh, the brackets means it's a proposed emerald, so it it's coming. Uh, so we know coming October 18, 2024, that emerald is going to drop to 0 0.3 parts per million. There is still a, a potential use pattern on certain market classes of dry beans going into the Japanese market where this is useful. So this is why I've highlighted this as a yellow, where in most cases, it's likely not acceptable. There's MRL concerns. However, in a cert certain situation where if your dry beans are going into the Japanese market, there's a, a potential use pattern there uh, that still allows its, its use. And with our, again, historical monitoring, that quality assurance programs in place, uh, we have the confidence that we can still meet that 0 0.3 parts per million if it's used going into Japan. So talk to your grain buyers to see if you're in this situation. Uh, I'm sure they'll, they're communicating that with you as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at lentils now, again, pre-harvest glyphosate is the same message as all the other crops, uh, so I'm not going to reiterate that. Just highlighting here, though, that you will see uh, green lentils highlighted. So we're highlighting that this, this classification is for green lentils. What this means is it's it's less communicated about red lentils. The rationale why it only says green lentils, it doesn't have red lentils. Uh, to be honest, the market acceptance issues are, are still there. The potential is there. I think it's more reflective of when you do communicate with your green buyer you're less likely to hear from your grain buyer that you're not allowed to use pre glyphosate on, on red lentils. So it's just, a, uh, you know, saving you the trip. Still encourage that conversation. By all means, have that conversation. Be aware of, again, the proper use, but just highlighting here that this is why you see green lentils uh, market or highlighted here, or more essentially that the lack of red lentils is just based on that. Uh, the next product I want to talk about is glufosinate and ammonium. Uh, so again, when I looked at that different product registration, so when you go into Western Canada, now there's difference in registrations too. So we do see a generic registration for, for glufosinate on lentils. This is not on the Liberty products. The Liberty products do not have lentils registered. So this is the generic products of glufosinate. There's a historical registration on lentils. That being said, our MRLs are not established in export markets. You know, if you look at Codex, EU, US, like they're either missing altogether or they're at the level of detection where, you know, if it is applied, it will cause that trade concern. So the message here is very simple. Do not use it. Do not use glufosate on, on lentils. And for that fact, any pulse crop as the MRL, it will cause an MRL concern. And this is extremely important for everyone in the industry to be aware of and just avoid the use of this product uh, to make sure we are not causing those trade concerns. Next slide. Finally, touching on peas, again, pre glyphosate glyphosate's on here, again, for that market acceptance issue, same messaging, make sure uh, if it is accessible, uh, acceptable, you know, talk to your grain buyer, making sure that there's no, um, you know, potential that that there is no case where they're, they're not asking you not to use it. If it is allowed for use, again, it's not a desiccant, uh, make sure it's using for pre harvest weed control, the timing has to be correct. I cannot reinforce that uh, enough. Looking at glufosinate and ammonium, uh, you can see that we've highlighted here, again, a red do not use, but there's an NR notation, it's not registered. So I, we, we want to make sure that, you know, this is very clear within the, within the industry that glufosinate is not registered on peas. You know, we understand that there's difference in the registrations. It can maybe be a bit of confusion. What's it registered on? What's it not? 
The message is the same. So for peas, it's not registered. And that MRL situation is just as poor as if, as if you look at for lentils. So there are no MRLs in our export markets. There is no US MRL. There is no Codex MRL. This will cause trade concern. So again, do not use glyphosate on any pulse crop ever. This is the message. Uh, please avoid this uh, as it will cause potential trade concerns. So just want to drive that one home. Uh, next slide. And from here, I pass it over to Ian from Canola. Thanks, Greg. Oh, I'll let my camera slowly adjust to bright light. Uh, we'll jump right into the product uh, advisory for Canola. Um, so we can make this real quick and maybe uh, make sure we finish on time here. Uh, there are no markets of concern for project registered on use in Canola. So that's a good news story. Um, we've been fortunate enough in the Canola world to have that for the last couple of years. Um, again, I'm going to talk about a few other things. There are still, there's always concerns. There's always things to be aware of going into the 2024 season. But products that are registered on canola, if used according to the label, and you've heard from Greg and Krista about some of those uh, things to think about as far as label restrictions or how the, the products are used, that we don't have, we won't have problems in canola from an export standpoint. Uh, next slide. The one thing I'll just highlight, uh, Lambda, we had a lot of talk about this last year. Um, and I'll give a quick update, and really the update is very simple. There is no update. Nothing has changed on the Lambda file. Um, we're kind of still in a holding pattern, um, still looking for resolution. Um, not happy that this is still uh, lingering and in the same thing, but we are in a holding pattern. So as far as guidance to agronomists, to growers, to people uh, preparing for the 2024 season, what you did last year probably worked pretty well. If you think you have a difference or if you have to use a product or you have some grain still kicking around or something has happened, it's always good advice just to talk to your grain buyer. They can walk you through the process. Maybe there is an angle, but again, we can't, uh, Lambda can't be used as a livestock feed. And so that includes screenings, aftermath in the value chain. So if your grain buyer has a, uh, a market that they think is safe, that they are willing to do that, um, you know, there are opportunities out there, but again, talking to your grain buyer is probably the easiest way to get through this. And, you know, there are a number of other insecticides that have, uh, that can control similar pests in all the crops. So you do have other options out there, especially as maybe you're preparing, review what those options are. If you are someone who has used a, a Lambda product in the past and just you know, know what your options are. And, and, and again, working with your grain buyer to work through, uh, uh, just to confirm if whether it's an option or better to uh, use a different product. Next slide. The other thing to talk about, so again, in Canola, we don't have any products in our advisory, but the the MRLs that are set in our primary export countries, and this will, I'll, I'll talk a little bit maybe about the Canola experience, but this works for uh, pulses and cereals as well, is those MRLs are set on expected residues if a product is used according to the label. Can't stress that enough. Even though it's registered, if we stray from that label, there is huge potential for MRLs. That's when we could have problems. So the first one there is the rate. Obviously rate is, it's pretty straightforward. The higher the rate potentially could lead to higher residues. So looking at the rates on the product labels. And again, I know as you get into the season, things get messy or sometimes maybe a weed will get big on you and you're like, well, I need a bit of a higher rate. I'm not sure if this is gonna be an effective rate. So that kind of would time into the second one on timing. If you are worrying about something that's getting away on you or something has happened, those logistical issues, they just crop up uh, once we get into the growing season. Um, making sure maybe we're applying our herbicide early, but rate is really important. So making sure we understand what the label rate is, always a good idea to review the label rate just in case maybe if, uh, if may, things usually don't change, but maybe you've uh, forgotten a little bit what the actual rate is or how many cases you need to that. So again, keeping on the on rate, and then I have other slides. I'll talk about timing and PHI. So uh, next slide. So timing, you've already heard a little bit about glyphosate. Glyphosate probably, that's the poster child for timing. It is really critical, absolutely critical in all crops, including canola, that we apply that at the right time. But timing is important for all, all anything we're having, any product we're applying that does have a residue potential. Again, getting it at the right time. That's what the MRLs are set for. That's what the industry, the due diligence that the various crop groups are doing is based on uh, being applied at the right timing. The other thing I would add to that, you know, this is a, a webinar where we're talking about uh, export issues or making sure our crops are export ready. But agronomically, those usually the window of which a product has is registered on label for timing. That's usually the optimal time to apply that product. So again, I know things happen in the growing season. There isn't always, sometimes fields get messy. Staging can be very difficult under challenging conditions where 
you know, you have a, a wide range, but again, that timing is really critical agronomically and for this. So and sometimes we're talking about the least mature parts of the field. And we have to be very careful on that, especially with glyphosate, but for all crops, again, staging those crops and making sure applying at the right time is just absolutely critical. Uh, next slide. This is one that just, uh, you can look a little bit there. It kind of shows us the range of uh, herbicide timings and canola stagings. In canola, we're fortunate we have a wide range, depending on what kind of canola you're growing, we have a wide range of applications for herbicides. And I just got to highlight, while you can apply in some of the new products, you can apply a higher rate and you can apply it later. And that's excellent to get you out of a jam if you were in. From a yield perspective, and especially going into a, a dry growing season, uh, earlier you control the weeds, and this is for any crop, usually the better the outcomes from a yield perspective. Weeds are taking nutrients from your crop. They are taking moisture from your crop. We're dry. Moisture will be at premium within the seed bed. Um, so again, while you have opportunity to go later, and again, staying on label is very critical. We always know things get delayed. Maybe you want to spray a little bit later, but then you get a, it's windy for a week or, you know, the sprayer breaks down. These kind of things happen. You can't get product the right time. Just to highlight that there's a lot of good agronomic reasons, in addition to the market ready reasons, to be applying those herbicides early. So just keeping on top of that, it also allows you to apply an effective rate that maybe is more making sure that rate is staying on label. A lot of synergy there and just something as you're planning out the growing season, as you're planning for 2024, things to keep in mind on trying to keep, uh, well, not, not put yourself in a jam, not have something happen and keep your grain expert ready. Next slide. And then pre-harvest intervals. Um, again, critical, all the work we do, uh, is, is kind of dependent on following those pre-harvest intervals. Uh, there's a wide range in products. We have some with zero, 60 days. So again, just being aware, that's something that maybe we don't always review quick when we're looking through. Rate is really important from an agronomic perspective, but PHI sometimes can maybe can get a little lost in the, in the shuffle. So maybe having a list of what the PHIs are for the products you're using. Certainly the ones that we apply a little closer to harvest, we have to be a little bit more aware of. The early season ones, usually that's less of a, a problem. Um, but there, there can be a wide range of PHIs between somewhat similar products. So maybe you're comparing the use of two products that are very similar agronomically. They might have very different PHIs. So as you push closer to harvest, might be keeping in mind which one you can apply as we get closer. And just to highlight this year that uh, for a good chunk of the prairies, we'll see how it plays out. But grasshoppers could be a bigger issue. And, and looking in the insecticides, there's a number of products that will control grasshoppers. You know, they work fairly well in the field. They're very similar, almost interchangeable, but the PHIs are different for several of those. And the other thing to consider um, if we do have a bigger insect year is some of those products you can only apply once or twice per year on the label. So just keeping that in mind, pre-harvest intervals and number of applications, if we do have a bigger, this works for any product, but it's picking on insects a little bit, because I think if we stay dry, we might have a, a, a bigger grasshopper year. That seems to be what the prediction is that keeping those things and kind of planning accordingly on which products you can use closer to harvest. And so maybe that helps you with your decision on which product you want to use first and which product maybe you want to save in case you do need to go back in for a second application. Again, pre-harvest intervals are just one of those things that can be a little bit sneaky, but if we follow the label for the most part with the timing, uh, we'll be in good shape. Next slide. I'll turn it back over to Heidi. Great, thanks Ian. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes. Um, if anyone does have any questions, just invite you to put those into the into the Q and A tab. Um, so yeah, please please submit your questions. We'll we'll try to wrap here on time in in the next three minutes. Um, maybe I'll just I'll just start with one here. Um, how do we find out if there is an MRL for a product and a crop? Um, maybe Greg, can I pass this one over to you? Yeah, absolutely. If, if there's any questions around MRLs, you know, what's the MRL and export market or any of those questions, please contact one of us. Whether it's Ian, if it's canola, go talk to Ian, uh, myself with pulses, Krista with cereals, uh, and we all talk to each other, but please reach out to any one of us and we'd be happy to to help you answer those questions and, and understand, you know, what, what that scenario, scenario might be. Perfect. Um, got another Another one related to the product advisory. So is it the same if a product is listed as not registered versus do not use on the advisory? Um, Krista, can you answer this one? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Heidi. And um, thanks for the question. So um, again, to, to point back to the policy that we use for making our categorizations, um, those are all based on products that are registered for use in Canada and then assessed. So if something is listed as um, not registered, it would it would indicate that it's not registered. So the policy doesn't apply to it and then also should not be used on that crop. 
Thanks, Krista. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, if you do have any questions following this webinar, please feel free to send us an email at info at keepitclean.ca or as Greg, Greg mentioned, just reach out to, to any of us at, um, at, the, at the organizations here today. So I'm gonna just wrap up the webinar. Um, just a few final notes. As you exit, please complete the Zoom feedback survey that'll pop up on your screen. We really appreciate your comments and feedback to help inform our future webinars. Um, as a reminder, we'll be emailing out a link to the webinar recording and a reminder to fill out the survey in the next few days. Um, you're welcome to share the recording with, with, your, with your networks, um, your colleagues, so please, please share those resources. Um, a quick heads up that we'll be hosting another webinar later this summer that's going to be focused on pre-harvest tips and tools. So I hope everyone here can plan to join that as well, and we'll communicate that date as, as soon as we can. And finally, um, for those of you interested in getting CEUs for participating in today's webinar, we'll be submitting a list of the CCAs who attended the live webinar today, along with the CCA numbers that we collected at registration. So if you missed providing your number, um, just in, e email us at info at keepitclean.ca and we'll add you to that list. So on behalf of Keep It Clean, I just want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar and a big thank you to our speakers for participating today. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks so much.